going to hazard a guess as to how many wind turbines there are on U.S. soil? The answer, nearly 50,000. Yeah, we have 50,000 turbines on land. Now, how many do you think we've got operating out at sea, offshore? I'll give you a hint. The number is a bit smaller than that. Okay, we've got one, one little tiny windmill, a junior-sized windmill off the coast of Maine. Now, that's going to change pretty soon because this fall, a much larger project, five full-size turbines are set to start spinning off the coast of Rhode Island. Maybe it'll give the naysayers who think not in my backyard a chance to see what these things look like. And since more states are signing on to install offshore wind farms, experts like my next guest say offshore wind could soon be blowing full speed ahead. Christina Archer is an associate professor in the College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment at the University of Delaware in Newark. Welcome to Science Friday. Thank you very much. <laughs> and Suzanne Tagan is uh, section manager for wind and water deployment at the National Renewable Energy Lab's Wind Technology Center near Boulder, Colorado. And she joins us today from KGNU. Welcome to the show. Glad to be here. If you've got uh, questions about wind power, 844-724-8255. That's 844-SCI-TALK. Uh, Dr. Tagan, I'll start with you because I understand you, you actually took your summer vacation at Block Island just to check out the new wind farm. Is this true? It is true. Yes, that that's true. Um, I My husband has family in Rhode Island, so uh, we visited them and then um, took the ferry out to Block Island, uh, which is a beautiful ferry ride. And once we got there, we biked around the island, and you can bike up to the Southeast Lighthouse and see this amazing sight. So I was with my husband and my two kids and um, some other family, and we got to see the installation happening. So there was one tower, and um, that was the day that the nacelle went up. The nacelle is kind of what houses um, the parts uh, that make that, that make the the wind power into electricity way up at the top of uh, the hub of the wind turbine. And so we got to see that happening. It was very exciting, and there were other people also uh, visiting the lighthouse just for that purpose to look out and uh, see see the new wind farm going up. So so this is pretty exciting for you. I, I understand not everyone's excited to see these out there, but for the most part, uh, Dr. Tegan, people on Block Island seem pretty receptive to this. Yeah, and so one of the things I study is community engagement and community involvement, and so I did uh, talk to some community members, and pretty much everybody I talked to was very excited about this project. In fact, I tried to buy some souvenirs like T-shirts or, or caps or something like that to bring back um, to the <laughs> Wind Technology Center or to my family, but they were all sold out. Um, there were pe people really, really excited about this, not only the tourists that were there, but also the people who live there. Um, there was one tourist uh, who had some, some negative things to say. He just said, you know, you used to be able to see the whole ocean from everywhere, you know, and now now you can see these turbines. But um, of course, there w there is still a lot of ocean out there, and there's one tiny little section um, where there are these five turbines. Uh, also, during the construction, there was a large uh, jack-up barge there, so a big vessel, um, and that's, of course, gone now, and all you have is the five turbines. And uh, to me, they're beautiful, but you can always look you know, the other way if you don't love them. But I, I do think um, that people will get used to them, and I'd love to hear you know, what those naysayers think in five years when they're more used to them. And I think you're right about um, you know, people people once people see these things up and operating and um, and benefit so much from the power block island residents will have cheaper power because of them so you know once they realize all of those things and see that they actually um, aren't so bad they'll be more widely accepted <laughs> yeah from what i understand the, the power is pretty expensive out on block island they're burning diesel fuel to get it so this is a big change for them dr archer how about you is this a, a pretty exciting time you think for offshore wind in the u.s Oh, it's fantastic. It's more than exciting. And I, I wish I could have gone to see the installation myself. I would have gone on vacation <laughs> to, uh, to, to see it. I will actually take my class uh, to, to see the site uh, possibly at the end of next month. It's an incredible, I can't believe it's finally happening. Uh, you know, five turbines in the water, finally. <laughs> well, you say you can't believe it's finally happening. And, and yep. with, with that, it almost sounds like a little note of resignation. There's a lot of places in the world where there's a lot more power. Why do you think it took so long, uh, Dr. Archer? Oh, yeah, I, 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 it's complicated, obviously, why it took so long. Uh, the, the previous case was Cape Wind, uh, perhaps well known to people. They were trying to install a farm in the Nantucket Sound. And the project started, it was supposed to, start, I don't know, they started collecting data in 2003, 
collected data for a lot of long long time and it didn't happen they were sued every other day so it, it did not happen in in europe meanwhile we we have uh, hundreds and hundreds of turbines in the water already and they've been operating for a long time uh, so it, it, it's a very exciting time because it's finally happening in the U.S. So, uh, and there's been a lot of space. Sorry, there's been a lot of yeah. space on on land in the U.S. You know, for for turbines to go in, and that's a lot less complicated. So turbines mm-hmm. have been going in on land here, but in Europe, um, that yep. it's more densely populated. So there isn't that open space as much as we have it, and they've moved offshore sooner. Well, uh, Dr. Tegan, just explain a little bit how big this this project is. I mean, we talk about five turbines, and we're we're celebrating this if we like the idea of offshore wind and this is very exciting but this isn't a very big wind farm is it no this is not a very big wind farm when you look at other so european offshore wind farms um it does look big um if you're if you're right up next to it uh, the towers (laughs) are 175 meters high um, and the hub height is 100 meters so um it will look big to people who haven't seen other ones but um right this um there are commonly uh, wind farms that are a lot bigger than this, um, and this one is, like you said, only th- uh, 30 megawatts and, and five turbines. Where you know we can we can see them in Europe with 20 turbines or more. So. And just so we understand, that 30 megawatts powers about how many houses? Well, so that depends. Uh, that's a good question. And um, I've seen quoted, for example, in the New York Times, I saw 17,000 homes. I've seen 21,000 homes, um, but it really depends. Um, generally, we we assume that one megawatt powers between three and four hundred homes but that's homes that are um, in so that they have their residence you know in them for the whole year whereas Block Island is um, much more much much less uh, populated in the winter time so uh, they probably factored some of that in I'm guessing but so the ranges that I've seen are 17,000 to, to 21,000 homes. So, so Dr. Archer are there some advantages to putting wind turbines offshore rather than on land I mean w- we have a lot of land in the central part of the United States and out west certainly and a, and a lot of wind but we also have an awful lot of offshore capacity we've run into problems in trying to site them offshore <laughs> so far but w- what do you say are the advantages to putting these turbines out at sea? Well, for the East Coast, I would say it's almost your only uh, wise choice. There isn't that much wind inland along the East Coast. We don't have really um, tall mountains. Uh, there's not The wind resource is not fantastic inland along the coast. And offshore, on the other hand, winds are whipping. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a very good idea to do it uh, offshore. In addition, the, the bathymetry, the, the depth of the ocean is favorable also uh, along the east coast. Uh, the, the continental shelf is... Uh, the right uh, granite and uh, the the depth is not very deep so you can do uh, foundations on a a regular traditional way so it's not you don't have to go to floating turbines or anything like that so you get the combination of good good wind and uh, uh, the right depth so it's it's very favorable well and explain that again for us so these aren't floating turbines some people might wonder that they're not floating off sea these are these are anchored into the ground right that's right. They have foundations. Yeah. Okay. So, but there is such a thing as as floating wind turbines. Are are those being used anywhere in the world? Are they something that could come offshore to America? Yeah, they 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 are used. They are a new technology, so they're not widely used. There are a couple of examples, I believe, offshore of the UK, and Japan uh, is considering the uh, installation of some of them uh, along the coast of Japan. And uh, they are more expensive at, at the moment than um, traditional uh, offshore fo- uh, turbines with a foundation. But they might be your only choice if you are in places like California, where the wind resource is excellent, especially in the summer, but the water is deep. And so you actually cannot do traditional turbines. You have to go with some kind of a floating technology. Uh, People have some questions about this. So let's go to Jeff, who's calling from Greendale, Wisconsin. Hi there, Jeff. You're on Science Friday. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Fascinating topic. Uh, Regarding the issue about people not wanting to see these, uh, what about putting them just beyond the horizon, which I think is roughly 19 miles out? Uh, Obviously, it's farther from the shore and a little more difficult to service. Uh, But then the other thought is, uh, aren't these very susceptible to being destroyed by hurricanes? And wouldn't any, almost any hurricane coming through wipe out hundreds and thousands of these at a crack? 
Boy, two two really good questions, and of course, a, a hurricane is bearing down on the East Coast here for the last couple mm-hmm. of days. So maybe you can take that that second question first, uh, Doctor Tagan. Why, why don't you take that? Are we in some danger of getting all these windmills knocked over by the next big hurricane? Uh, so the the hurric- the turbines that we designed today are built to withstand Category One and Category Two hurricanes, and we are um, working on designing. Uh, turbines to withstand Category 3 hurricanes, which are a lot less common, of course, the farther north you go. Um, and what happens generally is they they stop spinning. So um, at a certain speed, when the winds get too high, the turbines will actually um, stop spinning. They'll feather their blades um, and, and stop uh, working. And so far, um, at least the, the design right now, is we're, we're pretty positive that they'll be able to withstand the, the Categories 1 and 2. Hurricanes. Okay, so so Jeff's first question, though, and, and I'll ask you, Dr. Archer, it's this horizon question. I mean, people worry about being able to see these things offshore. Maybe they don't like them. They don't want them in their backyard or in their view. So can we just put them out beyond the horizon? <laughs> sure. It just costs more. And and think about all the cables that you have to build to connect them. They, they become longer. Think about how much longer it takes to maintain them and do any kind of uh, uh, adjustments or maintenance to the turbines if you have to, to go farther. It, it, it's not a bad idea per se because the farther away you go, uh, the more the wind tends to be, the stronger the wind tends to be. So it would be beneficial from that point of view. But then all these additional costs make it so that you have to kind of to find some kind of a compromise. In addition, the depth obviously tends to get uh, uh, deeper too and those costs become higher. But also you need to keep in mind that uh, uh, even, let's say, a seven miles, you see the turbines only when it's a spectacular day, uh, sunny, uh, no clouds, and no haze of any kind. Mm. If, if you have any kind of clouds, uh, there's a storm, there's fog, you, you're not going to see them. <laughs> you're just not going to see them. And most of the turbines um, that are being proposed right now, so most of the projects that are being proposed are about 10 miles offshore. So this Block Island one is unusual. It's actually in state waters, um, not in federal waters, but, uh, which is unusual for, for offshore wind projects, but the or at least for the future of them. Um, and probably the first few that our country sees will, will be closer in because um, it's, there, it's easier to install, um, maintenance will be easier. But, um, but we have about 16 gigawatts, uh, or up to 16 gigawatts, in the pipeline so that have been, uh, proposals have been submitted uh, for offshore wind development in the United States to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. And those ones are, like I said, about 10 miles uh, offshore. Uh, and you say we've got about 16 gigawatts in the pipeline. That's compared to, I don't know, how much in, in Europe that's operational right now, Doctor? Um, I don't know the, I'm not sure how many, how many gigawatts there are in Europe offshore right now. Because it, it, I've heard stories, uh, I, I don't know, Dr. Archer, that you know the country of Scotland was actually powering itself completely with offshore wind power not that terribly long ago. It's a really, it's a really big deal over there. <laughs> I didn't hear that. Um, it's possible that maybe for a few hours they were powered just by offshore wind. Scotland, yeah, it, it is very windy, and there have been a lot of uh, installations uh, offshore of the UK. So, but uh, yeah, I doubt that you can. Yeah, I doubt that you can power the, con- the entire uh, region for for more than a few hours. <laughs> uh, I'm John Although Dang- I'm sure those w- hours were amazing, but <laughs> <laughs> just just a couple of really great hours. Uh, I'm John Dankowski. Yes. This, this is Science Friday from PRI Public Radio International. I want to get to the phones again. Cynthia is calling from Bellingham, Washington. Hi there, Cynthia. Hi. What's on your mind, Thanks Cynthia? Thanks for taking my call. Yeah, of course. Um, well. I- I know that on land um, there have been some unexpected uh, negative impacts. As any time you introduce something new into Mother Nature's system, something something else uh, goes kaflui. And the the wind has caused problems for both raptors, um, you know, killing eagles and other raptors, and and then disrupting the bat population. Um, and I wondered what they found um, the introduction of wind turbines out on the water, I would think there would be some impact on shore on shorebirds, waterfowl migration, and then also um, the disruption of light from above to the marine species that um, are sensitive to light. 
Yeah, and, and also l- low frequency sounds, that sort of thing. Do- Dr. Yeah. Archer, how, how yeah. can you, yeah, I mean, maybe you can address those questions. And Cynthia, thanks so much for the, those questions. So the University of Delaware actually owns a wind turbine that that is not technically offshore, but is very close to being an offshore turbine. It's uh, less than 200 meters from the from the ocean. And uh, we have collected a lot of data on bird fatalities, bat fatalities, uh, and uh, um, uh, any any other accident that uh, could have happened around the turbine. And the numbers have been relatively, actually, small. Uh, the average is something like one rap- uh, one raptor per year for the turbine. Something like now I'm going by memory. I don't. This is not exactly my uh, field of expertise, but something like 15 bats per year uh, were collected around the turbine with a very intensive and very careful study. And so, it, it, it's not uh, a high number by any means. It's an average number. It's more of a myth that uh, turbines kill so many birds and kill so many uh, eagles. Uh, the the bad reputation. The bad reputation may come from the um, uh, the, the wind farm in California that uh, is actually was actually built on the migratory path of uh, uh, migratory birds, and so there was a high count at that farm because of, because it was in that particularly unlucky spot. Uh, in the rest of the world, the number of fatalities is actually very small. Mm. So I don't know exactly about offshore turbines uh, because in the U.S. we don't have any to to do any studies. But again, if the University of Delaware turbine is any representative of a coastal environment, we did not see any uh, extra uh, fatalities and, and, and with doctor, respect to the average. And, and Dr. Tegan, any worry about about marine life? Um, I guess, I, for, first of all, I would say that if you look at the bigger picture here, um, we are generating electricity from, um, from, you know, we're producing electricity that doesn't ad- uh, emit uh, greenhouse gases. And so the wildlife is going to benefit from that. You know, our oceans are, are warming because of other electricity generation. And so, they're, you know, that, that's... Um, of course, an impact to them, a negative impact to them. So we also have to kind of look at this. We step back and you know look at the bigger picture um, of costs and benefits mm. uh, to the to marine life. But um, I will say that um, there is very careful um, thought going into this. Every uh, project has you know s- the siting considerations. And for example, the Block well, Island one was and, very and, collaborative. And unfortunately, and unfortunately, we have to leave it there because it's such an exciting topic. Uh, Suzanne Tegan, thank you so much. Also. Christina Archer, thank you for joining us. We're going to be talking about storing some of that excess wind when we come back. This is Science Friday. I'm John Dankowski. We've talked about all that wind energy that we might be capturing soon, but as you've probably experienced, the wind doesn't always blow. So how can we save some of the energy from a windy day to use another time when we really need it? Michael Kintnermeyer has a few ideas. He's a staff scientist at the Pacific Northwest National Lab in Richland, Washington. Welcome to Science Friday. Good afternoon. So, first of all, how soon do you think we need to be thinking about storing all this excess wind energy that we were just talking about? I mean, do we need to come up with a big storage solution pretty quick? Uh, Well, um, storage has already been used. Uh, It's not really anything uh, new. Uh, regarding the integration and supporting the integration of variable renewables, wind and solar, uh, we're starting to see some potential issues there with not having enough flexibility. And these devices are really lending themselves to providing the flexibility. So it is not necessarily um, an issue of not having enough capacity. It is often not having enough flexible capacity that is capable of ramping up very quickly when the wind comes down and then likewise uh, being able uh, to ramp down when the wind uh, starts to blow again. Mm. And so it's more these flexibility that are causing, that causing potential problems. And so we're seeing already some of these um, batteries as well as um, non-battery solutions being deployed. Of course, I mean, we all think about batteries as being the the holy grail of storage. And if we could just get better batteries, then all of a sudden we'd be able to store all sorts of excess energy. But a lot of things we wanted to talk about here 
were not necessarily battery ideas. I mean, th- thermal storage and, and other ideas. I mean, for instance, there's a Canadian company uh, investigating these concrete eggs that are underwater. Explain how those work. Yeah. Um, the Canadian company uh, technology is called Hydrostore. And so they're using actually balloons um, that they are deploying down at the bottom of the seashore um, and blowing up with compressed air. So it is basically a compressed air um, energy storage solution. We have a big compressor blowing air into these balloons that are ex- that are being exposed to the hydrostatic pressure down on the seafloor. Um, and you pump them up uh, during charging periods. And then if you like to release uh, the energy, um, you're reversing the flow. And um, the pressurized air and the high pressure is then being expanded in a, in a turbine to reproduce electricity. And so the, the interesting um, aspect of this technology is that you can deploy them uh, pretty much anywhere. And um, the investor and, de- uh, and manufacturer of this technology envisions to co-locate it with offshore uh, wind deployment. So you can locate them very, cl- um, very close uh, to these offshore windmills that you just talked about and firm up the electricity. So it's a firming up um, solution there so that the combined wind and storage solution gives you more predictable power. And that provides some of the flexibility you were talking about before. Exactly. Um, so so exactly. Give, give us some other ideas about how to store excess energy, things that are working right now that maybe we don't know about. Well, um, we have been using a pumped hydro storage where uh, we're converting electricity into potential energy by uh, pumping water from a lower reservoir into an upper reservoir. Uh, And we can leave the water as long as we need it there. Uh, And when we need uh, to discharge the storage, we're reversing the flow, we're opening up the spigot, and the water rushes down, turns um, the turbines, the water turbines, to generate electricity. And so we have about uh, 22 gigawatts of uh, capacity in the United States, which is about 2% of the installed capacity in a about 10, um, one terawatt or 10,000 gigawatt um, system. And that is, quite, that is quite an amount. Now, we have been using it for reserve capacity, particularly for um, being able to provide the electricity if big, large baseload power plants are tripping off unexpectedly. So we have the ability to to open up the spigot and then uh, produce uh, electricity very quickly. So only recently have we used it more for balancing activities so that we can balance um, the uh, the fluctuation from from wind and solar. I, it, but it's just such a simple idea. You you have excess energy uh, on on a day, or maybe cheap energy overnight, and you just pump some water up a hill. And you, there are other ideas that are out there working like this. I, one that I heard about that's it's something like a train that's up on top of a hill, and it it comes down to release the energy. Yes, that's an interesting other solution. There, um, there is is. There are some, some developers uh, out in the state of Nevada, and so they requested approval to build what they call an advanced rail energy storage system. Uh, so here, again, the, the, the physical principle is very similar. You use electricity to turn it into potential energy by driving up an electrically powered locomotive with rail cars that are filled with nothing but dirt up a hill. <laughs> and uh, by doing that, you're storing energy and potential energy. And um, if you need the energy, you let the train roll down, you uh decelerating uh, the train, and by decelerating it, uh, by breaking it, basically, uh, you're converting back the, elect- uh, the kinetic energy into electricity. You, so well, it, it sounds like... 
you know, I was just going to say, it sounds like some of these ideas are are fairly simple ideas, but they take up a lot of space and a lot of infrastructure. I, I guess I'm wondering, Doctor, if, if if battery technology, you know, as small as we can possibly get them, isn't really the thing that we need to think about to be this flexible source of power so that we don't have to worry about building all this stuff, you know, giant trains and, and pumping water up hills. Um, well, what you're seeing is you're seeing uh, a wide spectrum of different technologies being pursued. So we have flywheel that are being tested and they are very successfully deployed in the mid-Atlantic uh, area. Uh, you're seeing pumped hydro. There's several pumped hydro um, installations that are in the pipeline. But you're seeing also these compressed air um, solutions there that look for cavern uh, in the ground. Now, their challenge is that you don't have the right geological formation all over the place, and you're looking for specific geological um, niches where you can deploy this. And you have other uh, solutions there. Um, th the challenge is that each of these different technologies, whether that is a battery, like an electrochemical storage device, or a mechanical storage device, has certain advantages and disadvantages. So a electrochemical storage does not scale very well cost-wise uh, with unit energy. So if you want to add more energy, you need to have more batteries. So in a pumped hydro, what makes really up the energy is more water in the, in the upper reservoir. So the water is relatively cheap. True. Uh, <laughs> and, and likewise, with these trains, all you need is putting on more dirt um, or more rail carts so, so on you're, the train. You, yeah, well, you're, you're, making a, you're making a pretty good case for some of these very simple technologies. We didn't even get a chance to talk about ice bears, where you, you know, use extra energy to make a big block of ice and then use it as an air conditioner. There's so many good ideas here. Uh, Michael Kintner-Meyer is a staff scientist in the Pacific Northwest National Lab in Richland, Washington. Thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you.